Hi, everybody, and welcome back. We're continuing with Chapter 14 with Section 3, and so far we talked about um, the, uh, some of the theories of the origins of the Earth and why it keeps getting pelted with stuff, and um, we talked, also talked about impacts and airbursts, what actually happens when these things strike the Earth and either create craters or create uh, massive shock waves around the Earth. Now we're going to talk about some of the effects that, um, <coughs> excuse me, that these, um, these impacts actually have. And of course, one of the major effects is mass extinctions. One of the first things you think of when you think of extinction is you think, you think of dinosaurs. That's absolutely the case. We're going to look and see what, um, what took place that um, we believe killed off the dinosaurs. But there's also a more recent extinction um, dealing with North American mammals like the woolly mammoth and the saber-toothed cat. So that's going to be involved in this section right here. So let's first just define extinctions, and all that is is simply a loss of numbers of plants and animals all suddenly, um, especially uh, with respect to the number of new species being added. Certainly, plants and animals do die off, all right? and new plants and animals are being added. Um, in biology, you would probably call that natural selection. But this is a real sudden loss, um, very out of step with the rate at which animals are typically dying off and new animals and plants are, um, are being created. So that, that's our kind of uh, definition of a mass extinction. And in many cases, these mass extinctions really define the beginnings of, and ends of geological periods or epochs. Now, a period and an epoch are different, uh, you might say, amounts of time um, in the geologic timeline. All right? But um, these things can... Um, these, these events can kill off all kinds of plants and animals. In many cases, they involve cl uh, rapid climate change. So you have like an ice age or a, or a warm spell or uh, something causing less uh, sun to, uh, sunlight to get to the earth. Um, plate tectonics plays a big part in that. All right? Plate tectonics moves habitats around. So habitats, if you're a warm, if you're a warm um, climate animal and your habitat is moving um, over time, maybe not you will get killed off, but your ancestors will get killed, or sorry, your descendants will get killed off because um, they may not be able to handle the climate as the, the plate moves to a different location. Volcanic activity, of course, can certainly have an effect on um, global warming. CO2 is really put out by, um, uh, by volcanoes. And ash as well, volcanic ash, can block out the sun. It can uh, deflect or reflect radiation from the sun back out to space, causing the, the Earth to be a lot colder than it currently is. And, of course, an impact or an air burst. Well, if you've got a big enough explosion taking place in the air, it's going to kill off lots of plants and animals, um, regardless of where you live, simply by the shock itself. All right, so like I mentioned before, there's several ages, uh, geologic ages, that are either um, started or ended um, by extinctions, by some sort of um, event that caused a lot of plants and animals to die. We have the Ordovician all right, extinction, uh, 446 million years ago. By the way, when you see MYA, that's what that means, million years ago. Uh, the Permian extinction, all right, attributed by, uh, to, to volcanoes causing global warming and cooling. All right. Triassic, Jurassic, you probably heard of these terms before. These are ages involving dinosaurs. All right. 202 million years ago, probably volcanic activity again. Also, um, Pangaea breaking up. This next one right here we're going to look at, um, the Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary, the KPG. All right. these, um, these are, uh, I guess, abbreviations. The Cretaceous, you'd say, why wouldn't you call that a C? Well, there's another one called the Cambrian that starts with C that you, um, that it, so C's already taken. So the Cretaceous starts with a K. That's believed to be about 65 million years ago, probably a result of an uh, asteroid impact. Uh, you've got an Eocene and also a Pleistocene e uh, impact, uh, epoch, sorry. Um, and um, human activity is actually kind of causing this to keep taking place. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about some of these uh, in a little more detail a little bit later. Okay, so if you take in biology, um, you probably know that, uh, that a genus uh, is the thing that comes right before a species, right? Kingdom, kingdom phylum, um, order, class, 
Uh, I need to remember my biology. Anyway, the last two are genus and species, all right? Well, this term right here, genera, oops, I'm going to circle that. Genera is the plural for genus, all right? So it's, you might think of it as families of, atom, uh, uh, of animals, not specific species themselves, but you might say the, uh, a broader family. Um, and so what this graph shows us is how, uh, how many different genera of, um, of organisms there are as these, these geologic ages take place. So you have whatever it dips down right here, that means there's an extinction. There's some, an extinction, an extinction, extinction here, a big extinction right there. So the Permian, the Triassic, the late Cretaceous, um, uh, the Eocene, this little guy right here, this extinction. Uh, then it, you can see generally over time there's more and more and more different kinds of organisms, um, partly because of adaptations and stuff like that. But every time this dips down, you have a mass extinction. All right, so 65 million years ago, when we had this um, Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, um, that was the disappearance of the dinosaurs. All right, 70% uh, it's believed of all of the genera, that is, genus is, um, of these of plants and animals died, including the dinosaurs. All right, so really what it did was it set the stage for kind of the, the takeover of mammals, uh, mammals uh, taking over on land. Um, things like woolly mammoths and saber-toothed cats and that kind of thing. Okay, so the first thing you might ask is, well, how do they, how do they even know? 65 million years ago, that's a long time, first of all, and how do they even know this was even an asteroid impact? Well, we talked about how um, the presence of iridium, iridium right there, a very rare uh, element on Earth, but very, pre uh, very present, very in high, in high concentrations in asteroids and meteorites. Um, this was... Um, discovered by a, uh, a geologist, Lu oh, L sorry, Luis Alvarez and his son, Walter. Um, there's a clay layer in Italy that they decided to measure the concentration of iridium in. Okay, and it was found to have quite a bit of iridium, which, suggest, which suggested, hey, there was possibly some sort of asteroid impact right here. And a thing that was also interesting they found was that below the layer of iridium, kind of like... Uh, um, kind of like the black mat, if you've heard us talk about the black mat in class, where um, uh, you had this extinction. Um, below this layer, we found fossils that we did not find above the layer. Now, if you think about it for a second, layers form from the bottom up, right? So dinosaurs, 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 dinosaurs. Here's this layer right here, and then no more dinosaur fossils, all right? So it forms from the bottom up, and so that says they were all living, well, or they died, or they were in existence right there until this event. And when that event took place, they were no longer around to make fossils as more and more layers were, um, were built. Um, they, uh, the iridium deposits say that the, the, the clay layer that they were looking at formed pretty quickly because iridium really does not rain down on Earth all that fast, and so it had to form in a very quick um, period of time. So they, they concluded that it was probably a result of a single asteroid impact that threw all that iridium into the atmosphere, caused it to land in a single concentrated layer, and in the process, killed off the dinosaurs. Alvarez, that is Luis Alvarez's problem, however, was the fact that he did not have that smoking gun. He did not have the actual crater that he said that you could say, ah, oh, here it is, right there. However, in 1991, we found it. It was in the, uh, in the very tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. I'm going to show you this map in just a second right here. But um, if you know anything about the Yucatan Peninsula, that's where uh, Cancun is on. In fact, I'll just flip over to the map right now. All right, I believe Cancun is right about here, All right, and so this, this big peninsula, it was kind of on the back side of it right there. This is, this is called the Chicxulub Crater, the one that was, uh, looks pretty hard to pronounce, but actually isn't all that bad. Um, let me go back here a minute. That was the crater, and so it was at the very tip of the Yucatan Peninsula, but it was buried under many, many, many layers of sediment. Um, almost perfectly circular, in fact, and it was a complex crater, which means the middle of it was raised up, in sort of that, uh, that little hill in the middle. And um, interestingly enough, on the edge of it, on the land, which let me go back to it first. 
um, here and here and here, maybe a little here and here and here. We have all kinds of, on land, we've got all kinds of interesting sinkholes. And in fact, there are many places in, uh, on Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where you can, um, you can do underground caving and um, kind of the snorkeling underground. It's really kind of interesting. It's really all along the rim of this crater right here. The rest of it is out in the ocean, or I should say out in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but this whole thing is really buried under several, um, well, many, many, many sediments um, that really hit it until 1991 when it was discovered. But look at this diameter, the diameter, 180 kilometers, 112 miles in diameter. My goodness, that's like from here to, um, oh, I'm trying to think how far that is, about 60. So it's probably from here to almost the Jersey Shore for us. Uh, that's the diameter of this, um, of this crater. Very, very large. All right? And even possibly as deep as 25 miles deep in depth. So a giant, a huge hole knocked in the side of the earth. Um, and so over time it got filled in, and so you had to kind of um, you had some like landslides and slumps filling in the crater, and then other sediments being deposited on it. Um, but as we drill down into the crater, we do find breccia. All right, and breccia, we said, is a good indicator that something slammed into the earth because we don't have weathered particles; we've got very, very jagged particles cemented together. Um, and so what that, in, in, that suggests is a lot of intense heat, probably because, because of this object striking the Earth. All right, so these next few slides, and really the last few slides of the section, are going to take you through kind of step by step what we think actually happened in this uh, Cretaceous Paleogene a mass extinction, way about 65 million years ago, we believe. So a big asteroid, a large asteroid, about 30, um, I'm sorry, about 30 kilometers per second, moving very, very fast, slams into what is now what we would call the, um, the Yucatan Peninsula. All right? Crater as maybe as wide as 200 kilometers in diameter, 40 kilometers, 25 miles deep take place. All right? And so the shock waves, not so much the object itself, but the shock waves sent out from all the kinetic energy that the object has, that does a lot of damage to rocks uh, in the surrounding area crushes them, melts them, vaporizes them in many, many cases, all right? And so you have this expanding, um, kind of expanding shock wave going out in all directions like that. That's really what's doing a lot of the damage. Okay, so what happens after that? Well, this is possibly even only a few seconds after that because this thing has been moving so fast. We have a blanket of ejecta being formed. Remember, ejecta is stuff that was previously in that area right there, but that has now been thrown out. And so it's been thrown out in all directions from this impact right here. Uh, you also have a mushroom cloud. Now, a mushroom cloud really is just um, very, very hot air and gases rising up like that. But what it tends to do is, as the outer gases kind of slow down a little bit, the, uh, the inner gases will keep wanting to move up and of course then they slow down a little bit and the inner gases keep wanting to move up so you just kind of have like this swirling around effect taking place where the inner gases are um, are moving most rapidly and so all around the edge right here um, you have this kind of swirling around so um, that's why we call it a mushroom cloud obviously because it looks like a mushroom in many cases sometimes you see rings around the mushroom cloud like that. Those are really shock wave rings um, going through the air. As you compress air, and then it's got this kind of an uncompressed area behind it, it causes water vapor to condense. And so those, the, it's actually clouds you see, those ring-shaped clouds are formed because of the, the compression of this, um, this mushroom cloud. But very much like a nuclear bomb, we think that may have happened as a result of this object striking the Earth at the Chicxulub crater um, in the northern Yucatan. We also have, we believe, sulfuric acid entering the atmosphere. All, right? all kinds of chemical reactions as a result of this heat and this impact take place. And so sulfuric acid, very, very caustic, very dangerous, and probably killed a lot of uh, plants and animals, organisms that way. The ejecta blanket of dust blocks sunlight, so you don't have photosynthesis anymore. All right? And not just that. But in the areas of the world that are not covered with uh, land, but are covered with um, water, you have tsunamis, enormous tsunamis, maybe a thousand feet tall. All right, so that's um, just 
maybe about, what's that, about a little less than a quarter of a mile. All right, so um, very, very large tsunamis, all a result of this energy being unleashed on the Earth. As we continue in our steps here, what happens maybe a month later? Well, we still don't have any sunlight because we still have a lot of this ejecta being thrown up, um, that, that was thrown up in the air, still in the atmosphere. And so that blocked out a lot of the sunlight, preventing photosynthesis, preventing um, consumers from eating uh, plants, and therefore preventing predators from eating the, the consumers. Um, meanwhile, acid rain is still continuing to fall, right? Really creating a lot of um, uh, corrosion and killing of plants and animals as well. And the food chain basically stops, all right? Because your support for the food chain, the, um, the plants, are all killed, due in part to the fact that there's no more photosynthesis. However, several months later, after all this dust settles back down, we now have the sun's rays able to reach the Earth's surface again. And so photosynthesis can actually restart. Um, the, uh, all these particles in the atmosphere are no longer um, mixing with rain, and so there's no longer any acid rain. And you even have the beginning of simple plants again. It's believed that ferns are some of the the earliest plants, and so one of the first things to return would actually be ferns, especially if you have sunlight for photosynthesis. Okay, so what is that all to say? Well, it's really uh, all to say. First of all, it's first of all it's just speculation. Um, it's our best guess at what's uh, what's going on, or, or what is what happened 65 million years ago, and what may still happen in in the future, and what we could possibly expect of this kind of thing. Uh, were to happen on this scale, all right? So the impact of the, the 65 million years ago of the cretaceous Paleogene impact in, in the Yucatan Peninsula can uh, cause a lot of extinctions. Oops, I'm crossing that out. Cause a lot of extinctions, but probably not all animals and plants were killed, um, but rather it allowed mammals to, um, uh, to continue living. Um, Think about it, if you have the sun being blocked out for a long period of time because of dust, if you're a cold-blooded creature like a dinosaur, you're probably not going to be able to sustain any body heat and you'll probably die. Mammals, uh, by contrast, are able to regulate their own body heat and are probably more likely to live through an event like that. Um, even so, if another impact this size took place, it probably would mean the end of life um, as we know it for humans and lots of other large mammals as well unless we figure out some way to mitigate it and, and ride it out until the Earth kind of resettles. The good news is impacts of this size are very rare. They don't happen all that very often, uh, once every 40 to 100 million years. All right, so 65 million years ago, this was the last main one. Well, we're, maybe we're due for one, but um, we're kind of right in the middle of that time period. Um, even so... Um, I wouldn't worry about one tomorrow because if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, it's not worth worrying about. But they do happen over a long period of time. I think what we're more prone to be concerned with is the, uh, the risk of smaller impacts. That is things like Chelyabinsk, that is the airburst over Russia. Or Tunguska that exploded over um, Siberia, which is part of Russia, in 1908. Killed lots of people, and if you're one of those people that happens to be underneath that, then you run the risk of being killed, and regardless of whether your whole species um, goes extinct or not, at least you're extinct. So um, that's something you want to be able to at least be aware of. So this, is, um, this has been our section three. I'm going to stop right here talking about some of the things that can happen as a result of these impacts. And... Um, and then as we go forward, we're going to link these impacts to other natural disasters. But in the meantime, once again, I'll thank you for following along, and I'll see you on the next one.